Welcome back to Follow the Compass North. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about knife nomenclature, but I'm also going to be showing a couple of knives and showing what I look for in a good survival knife. But in order to do that, it's good for us to be on the same page. Now I don't try to hold people accountable by saying that they need to call a bolster a bolster, a tang a tang, or a spine a spine. A knife is a knife, there's a blade and there's a handle, we get it. I am not a terminology snob. But it is nice to keep people on the same page, especially in the case of trying to do a little education, which is what I'm here to do. Now the knife you've seen me use on most of my channel videos is this Ontario Drop Point. Um, I'm pretty partial to this knife. There's a lot of great attributes. It's got a lot of great function. Uh, fits my hand really, really well. I don't think it's perfect for me. There's still a, some improvements that I could make on this. The, Drop point isn't really my style for it to be tilted down like that. I like straighter knives right across the back of this tang in the spine. I like them to be straighter all the way across as one single piece. Uh, I'm not a big fan of having a lot of thumb chamfer here uh, for your thumb to catch and get purchase on uh, here north of the bolster. The bolster being the piece that prevents your hand from slipping up onto the knife. I also personally prefer a larger bolster. I always have this fear of my hand slipping up the knife and cutting all of my fingers uh, and in order to stop that I like to have a a much larger bolster just an oversized knob on the bottom there. Our belly of the blade is this bottom portion here just below the spine which is the extension of the tang talk more about the tang here in a second. The tip we understand in the bevel as I explained in my knife sharpening videos is the shiny portion here the piece that we're actually bringing the steel down to meet into a point. Your bevel is going to be different on each knife. I tend to make this one right here uh, which brings it back about 3 16 of an inch at about a 22 degree angle but again I don't not really measuring that that's just uh, the angle that I have the file when I'm setting these bevels on the back end of the knife our tang and our scales make up the handle uh, this is my favorite type of tang it's a full tang knife a partial tang could be just having metal in the handle here a hidden tang knife has a tang hidden by the handle material uh, you can have a hidden tang that is also full, which is, runs the full length and makes these uh, sides to handle very weak. However, my favorite method is to have the tang exposed all the way around the back and underside of the blade. That way I know that there's no weak points in here. There's a few drill holes, which would be the weak point if you had to pick one, but it's not tapered to the point where it's just a shard. If you take a cheap kitchen knife and smash it open, you'll see that it just has a shard of metal running back into the plastic, uh, and that's where they usually fail and break. That's where you have the blades break off. The solid full tang gives it a lot of great weight in the hand, and it gives it a lot of strength as well. These two pieces on the side that complete the handle with the handle fasteners, uh, and typically there's three, but we can see more of those in different styles of knives that I'm about to show here. Uh, these portions on the side here are called scales. Your scales can be made up of all kinds of materials. This is a compressed fiber material. I really like these. Uh, knives that come with this or that are along this uh, quality would be um, ESEE -E knives, sometimes called SE knives. Uh, again, not affiliated. This is an Ontario, which is one of my favorites out there as well. And there's a lot of other makers and um, manufacturers out there. The, these days, it doesn't really matter who you go with as long as you have what you want in that tool. So for me, if I find a knife that's made by an off-brand and it's got a full tang, it's made of good steel, it's powder coated, it's got nice scales and it fits my hand nicely, I'm going to use that. Most steels these days are great. Uh, there's very few companies out there using uh, suboptimal steels and they very quickly lose popularity and, and, uh, and drop down in the ranking. So anything you see in the SE, Rat Cutlery, uh, Ontario Knives uh, spectrum is going to be a fine knife uh, as long as it fits you nicely. So this is the one I'm using for a lot of my demonstrations. And then this is the one that I've built. 
I've been forging knives for about a year now. This is the best one that I've made. I went with a Damascus billet. Uh, you can see the layered 15 and 20 and 1080 steel. Uh, when you're, I took uh, this billet, uh, had it made by another uh, smith who had a power hammer. He was able to smash out this billet with this layered steel. And when you're working it, you can't see these layers. It's just polished steel while you're working at the forge and it gets up, builds up scale. You have to file it down and hammer it and sharpen it and polish it. And the way that you get this pattern to come out is by dipping this in a ferric chloride acid solution. The acid wears away the metal that is higher in nickel and you're left with these recessed black portions from the 15 N20 and then the 1080 steel doesn't etch away, it stays up top and very prominent. So you get this textured feel to it, and that's modern day Damascus. We could talk about Damascus, modern day versus classic uh, for hours, and, and people have. This is just an example of one that I ordered and then shaped into my own knife using my forge. So I did a acid etch for the, uh, for the Damascus here. The scales that I used on this, and notice it's full tang all the way around just as I like. The bolster is huge, uh, so my thumb or my uh, finger fits really nicely in here, so it's never going to pop out. And if it does, I have this little second cutaway for my finger to lock into. I'll probably cut it a little bit, but at least it's strong there. I modeled it after my hand specifically because I wanted all my fingers to fit here. This one's pretty good, but I ride up on the back edge a little bit. And then I wanted to have a very strong uh, handle uh, attached to, or those really strong scales attached to my handle. So I use these four mosaic pins. Uh, and I just ordered a mosaic rod off of Amazon for that. And some hollow six millimeter uh, brass rod as well for lashing purposes. Uh, a lot of these will have lanyard holes. And when you're tying this to the end of a stick as an impromptu spear, uh, or an improvised weapon, uh, they get a little floppy. So I put on two here that I could run 550 cord through. So if I do ever have to lash this to an extension of some sort, I've got two anchor points. I don't intend to use this knife that way, uh, but if I ever get to that point, it'll be pretty handy to have. Now the scales, as I was mentioning earlier, these are a live oak. Well, it's a dead oak, but it was a live oak species. Ha ha for all you arborists out there. This live oak, <clears throat> excuse me, this live oak was blown over in a hurricane down here uh, in northern Florida. Uh, fell over in my yard, was able to chop it up uh, into eight foot sections, and then was able to cut these scales out of it using my sawmill. Pretty happy with this overall. The, a lot of the effort that went into making such a beautiful knife, the Damascus and the mosaic pins, uh, those were not me, that's me just buying nice materials, but that putting in together with a piece of wood that I milled with my sawmill and forging it in my forge makes me feel like it's a pretty nice piece. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Next round, I'm going to make the blade a lot smaller. This belly portion is going to be much sleeker. <clears throat> I made this one as big as I could because I wanted to show off this Damascus, but I find that it looks a... A little paddly, a little heavy on the front end here. The balance is almost perfect because I was able to keep a real nice tang on here, but it would be a little thinner, it would be a little nicer. I'm almost, almost satisfied with the handle. It's about where I want it to be. But that's the joy of looking at your knives and finding what you want in a knife. Which one's perfect? This one's pretty darn close, but it needs some improvements. Then I designed and built this one, which I felt would be a lot closer, and it was but it still has a little bit to go before I make the ultimate survival knife. And once I find mine, and I think it's perfect, and I pull it out and show it to another survival instructor, they're gonna start ripping it apart because it's not what they want either. Then they're gonna show me their favorite knife, and I'm gonna say, oh man, it's way too big, you don't need a machete out here, or you have no finesse with the handle, the balance is all up. There's a lot of people out there being real snobby with their knives. The bottom line is, find what works for you, Make sure it fits you nicely and that's safe and reliable and go from there. So that's knife nomenclature mixed in with a little bit of show and tell of one that I made as well as what to look for and when selecting your own personal knife. Hopefully you found uh, something useful today. 
Uh, if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. Check out our other videos. Leave a like, subscribe, share. Anything you do to help the channel is greatly appreciated. So thank you and have a great day.